and um, the, the Bowen uh, lectures. Um, those are all now free on our website. So if you have not checked those out, uh, I invite you. So thank you. And thank you, Anne, for putting this together. And again, um, Stephanie Ferreira, thank you. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Collier. Um, tonight, we are, uh, Mrs. Ms. Stephanie Ferreira has been a student and trainer in Bowen theory, beginning in her MSW studies in 1974 at the Jane Addams School of Social Work at the University of Illinois. There, she heard James Ramo speak about Dr. Murray Bowen's anonymous paper, which spurred her to read his book, Family Therapy and Clinical Practice. In it, she discovered his key concept in chapter 21 on the differentiation of self. She was challenged by the idea that one person's work to learn about one's own functioning in the family, emotional connectedness can potentially affect the functioning of other family members and the unit by understanding both systems ideas and awareness of emotional processes in self and in the family. In 1978, Ms. Ferreira entered the postgraduate program at the Georgetown Cent Family Center, now the Bowen Center for the Study of the Family, in Washington, DC. In this training program, one is assigned a coach or supervisor who assists a student in efforts to discover the emotional challenges in one's own family and oneself while learning the theory. She also participated in the four times a year program for two years. Chicago has remained her home all these years and there Ms. Ferreira is a founding faculty member of the Center for Family Consultation. She has developed programs and has taught theory, including clergy consultation groups. Ms. Ferreira has written articles for the Bowen Center journal, um, journal Family Systems and for Family Systems Forum in the Houston area. She has written chapters for books when approached and has delved into such subjects as human territorialism, tribalism, the root of altruism, emotional neutrality, and regressing systems. Ms. Ferreira has read extensively in the natural sciences, especially evolutionary biology. Tonight, she will present her ideas on the evolving relationship between humans and Earth. Let us welcome Ms. Ferreira. Um, thank you. Thank you. And what a generous introduction. I can't remember doing all those things, <laughs> but that, at my age, memory is one of the things that goes. Um, I have my um, presentation here, which uh, is, I think, the best way to uh, follow it would be to just go with the slides. I have everything on slides, uh, and I will kind of read through them without much uh, further commentary. And there, it should uh, end up in less, it would be approximately an hour, hopefully a little less if I don't lose track of what I'm doing. <laughs> so let me just say that when I look at this title, it seems a little ambitious. <laughs> um, but uh, I figure uh, all I could do with it is, is really just put together a few ideas that relate to it and that's uh, so that's that's what i'm going to do and uh, it will start out with a, an idea from dr bowen um, man has overcome i'm trying to get this thing off of the way out of the way man has overcome many of the forces that threatened his existence in former centuries his lifespan has been increased by medical science his technology has advanced rapidly. He has become increasingly more in control of his environment. Um, so it sounds like kind of a description of the human success story. And Bowen wrote this in the context of his uh, writing about the environment and the emotional process in society. 
in the 1970s. Moving on to the next slide, finally. Uh, look, I like to look at the origin of species. I love to, uh, consult, to consult it because it seems like I often find that if I have a question and I ask myself what would Darwin say and I look it up, I, I find that he actually has said something about it. Well, this is what he said about growth, the, dy the growth dynamic. There is no exception to the rule that every organic being naturally increases at so high a rate that if not destroyed, the earth would soon be covered by the progeny of a single pair. A struggle for existence inevitably follows from the high rate at which all organic beings tend to increase. So nature has to uh, exert some constraints on this growth process, uh, and it does so. The rate of increase is countered by the rate of destruction, which includes uh, the destruction of egg seed seedlings, the predation process, the crowding, and uh, Darwin thought of most important of all was climate, the droughts, the floods, the extreme heat, or cold. All of these are ways of constraining growth. Um, but what have humans done? Humans have overcome nature's constraints to a certain degree, uh, slowly and incrementally over thousands of years. Um, so through wars, in spite of, of the destruction wrought by wars, epidemics, famine, and natural events, the overall trajectory has been toward growth in population, production, and consumption of resources, knowledge, division of labor. With division of labor, you can get more uh, specialized areas of work in growth in commerce and trade and growth in complexity. This book uh, is, uh, was a great uh, discovery for me. It's the work of a British historian, Ian Morris. He's written a number of books. In this book, Foragers, Farmers, and Fossil Fuels, he proposes that the way people made a living uh, had a lot to do with the way human values evolved. So I'll say a little bit about each one of these three categories. Morris's approach um, in his book is to sweep up into a single story, hundreds of societies, thousands of years, millions of people, looking at how humans make a living through the three eras of foraging, farming, and fossil fuels. Each way, each is a, a way of capturing energy from the earth and also a way of organizing society. Morris's main thesis is the way a society supports itself, influences its values regarding hierarchy, equality, and violence. So I'll just briefly uh, mention a few things about the foragers. They deserve <laughs> more than just a mention because they were the way of life for most of human existence. Foraging was the mode of life for 90% of human history. It still exists in some groups. It is defined as the hunting of wild animals, gathering of wild plants, and fishing. Typical groups were small with simple division of labor based on age and gender. There are boom and bust cycles of rapid population growth and starvation. So the foragers had a ability to live on the earth without really altering the earth very much. In the way Morris puts that is he says this mode of energy capture does not deliberately alter the gene pool of exploited resources. He kind of uses, he uses this language of energy capture. The values that the forager had, forager had uh, lived by 
foraging as a system of energy capture puts strict limits on accumulation of wealth. Sharing is a high moral value enforced by social pressures. This book, Limited Wants, Unlimited Means, is the work of uh, economist John Gowdy. It was published in 1998, and it's an edited book that, and with chapters written by a number of anthropologists who studied different hunter-gatherer societies. And just a quick a comment on foragers is that foragers found and shared resources without accumulating possessions that would have been a hindrance in their mobile way of life, free of material possessions. You know, that is a kind of a freedom <laughs> that we don't, we, we don't, uh, we probably should learn to pursue that freedom a little bit more, being free of material possessions. They found security in their social, intellectual, capital, and egalitarian communities and sustainable relationship with nature. So I'll say a little bit now about farmers. Farmers are people whose most important source of energy is domesticated plants and animals. Farming emerged between 15,000 and 10,000 years ago and spread across the planet with far greater speed, scale, and thoroughness than foraging. As populations grew, people migrated in search of new farmland discovered the great rivers that could be used for irrigation, transport, and communication. As each agricultural core grew, it went through a slow motion explosion in energy capture. Farmers became increasingly effective at exploiting domesticated resources. So this picture is not the early farmers, it looks like more of uh, the agriculture, the industrial agriculture that we have now. Uh, Morris says a steady increase in energy captured per acre of farmland made it possible to feed millions of mouths. But it came at the price of constant backbreaking labor. The life of the peasant has been characterized by poverty, squalor, and poor health. Agriculture changed everything in the world. Uh, the discovery and basic and spread of agriculture set humans on a path to economic and social change that transformed human life and the ecosystem. The ability to produce food through domestication of plants and animals gave farmers a new level of control over the food supply with little or no understanding of the long-term consequences, they began to acquire control over nature itself. Along with all that change, uh, there was a shift toward hierarchy. Increasingly complex division of labor was required by the scale of farming societies. Large-scale organizations needed labor beyond the kin group, so they turned to um, hiring people to market-based wage labor, and also there was forced labor. Morris uh, cites Sathen, Athens, Athens as the example of as many as one person in three was a shadow slave. Few, if any, farming societies did without slavery or served them all together. On the brighter side, um, the division of labor freed a percentage of the population to pursue intellectual life and expansion of knowledge. I, this is more from, from Morris. I thought it was really interesting the way he explained how hu farmers adapted to hierarchy. Um, between about 4000 BC and 1 BC, political and economic inequality became deeply entrenched. 
the old deal was a social contract that dominated the agrarian world. Peasants and elites were deeply interdependent. All parties had duties as well as rights. A great chain of being linked the humblest peasants to the supreme beings with the intercession of priests, nobles, and godlike kings, guaranteeing the fundamental justice of the political and economic hierarchy. A pattern emerged of general acceptance of glaring wealth inequalities, combined with glum, grumbling resentment against them and occasional outbursts of leveling rage. So Morris is really saying um, people accepted hierarchy, but when it became unfair or it, they felt that the rules weren't being followed, that uh, were, would be times when people began to rebel against, probably the peasants rebelling against those um, I don't, uh, who, were, who were oppressing them. So how did this change the human relationship to Earth? In contrast with foragers who do not deliberately alter the gene pool, farmers do. F humans interfere in other species' reproduction sufficiently to create selective pressures that lead these other species to evolve into entirely new species, which can only go on reproducing themselves with continued human intervention. I think that's, a, you know, I highlighted that. I think it's a very interesting way of, of stating how humans humans began to alter nature uh, and to some extent uh, control nature. So new species could only go on reproducing with continued human intervention. Domesticated plants and animals were the originally original genetically modified organisms. So that what we think is kind of recent is actually quite old genetically modified organisms. So how did that affect the way people looked at the natural world? Uh, it it's not hard to see how a hierarchical view would have influenced that. People continued to deepen their knowledge of nature, but now they had an eye to enrichment opportunities. What, what, could, what could they uh, do to um, benefit more from nature? Exploitation of nature could be rationalized by a hierarchical view that placed humans at the pinnacle of creation, divinely ordained to hold dominion over earth and its bounty. And that is actually an idea that I was familiar with growing up, didn't really question it a lot. I turn now to um, how the world became global. I, David Christian has a, uh, again, a kind of an encyclopedic book uh, called Origin Story, a big history of everything in which he starts with the Big Bang, to the stars, the solar system, and all the way to current life, uh, what's going on right now. The pace of growth gained speed with the turn toward globalization that began in the 15th century. In 1400, the world was divided into distinct zones. In 1492, Columbus sailed the Atlantic, as we know, and after, over the next three centuries, membranes separating Australia, Australasia and Pacific zones were breached. David Christian writes, for the first time in human history, people would start exchanging information, ideas, goods, people, technologies, religions, and even diseases across the entire world. By the late 18th century, it became evident that most arable land was being farmed. Uh, in 1798, Thomas Malthus made his famous statement that 
populations can grow exponentially, but the food supply is finite. Adam Smith and others saw societies pushing the limits of energy flow. They warned that growth would stall, wages would fall, and so would populations. Into that overtaxed world, fossil fuels came to the rescue. Exploiting vast deposits of coal, gas, and oil buried under the Earth's surface set off an energy bonanza, transforming human societies and values. Fossil fuels began to be put together with steam power in the 17th century. Finding new sources and new methods of extraction and transmission gave rise to new business, legal, and financial institutions. The remarkable 20th century, um, and I really think these, these numbers are, are stunning uh, to consider. At, in 1800, the world population was just under 1 billion. By 1900, 1 1.6 billion. By 2000, 6 billion. And in 2018, 7.6 billion. So the 20th century brought more than a tripling of population, despite the millions of lives, many of them young lives, that were lost to wars, epidemics, and famines of that century. So it's something to, to it seems amazing, amazing that, that so many lives lost and yet the growth trajectory was uh, going full speed ahead, it seems. Consider also that the century gave rise to an expanding middle class with a higher standard of living and a doubling of life expectancy. David Christian writes, total energy consumption doubled in the 19th century and then rose by 10 times in the 20th century. Human consumption of energy rose much faster than human populations. So these are, this is a little summary of just very scan, uh, a few points of uh, what happened with fossil fuels. Um, the extraction of vast deposits of fuel, um, the energy bonanza, the Industrial Revolution, the transforming of societies, accelerated growth, high wages drew people from the farm to the factory. An enormous middle class was created, able to buy the goods and services that fossil fuel economies produce. There was a trend toward smaller family size, infant mortality was reduced, women and babies were healthier, there were more women working outside the home, and there were social movements um, coming uh, to increase, forcing, focusing increasingly on human rights. So putting, you know, kind of um, pausing a minute to think about all of that change, uh, I was asking myself, what about the family? Uh, here, uh, the family is participating in all this change and adapting to all this change in the conditions of life. So I want to spend a little time looking at that. Farming impacted the family. Uh, the scale of agricultural societies led to creation of economic enterprises far bigger than the family. But the family did remain the basic building block in farming economies. The internal structure of families, however, changed beyond all recognition. That's again from Ian Morris. Farming enabled, there was a new um, division of labor enabled by, and more complexity, heavy labor, plowing, manuring, irrigating, 
made farming increasingly men's work. Women were pushed out of the fields, pulled into the home. Farm wives had more babies than female foragers. In addition to the work of managing households, most material goods were produced within the household, including weaving, pottery, food processing. Morris says the demog demography and the patterns of labor conspired to separate male outdoor and female indoor spheres. And Melvin Connor definitely picks up on that idea. Uh, his wonderful book, Women After All, Sex Evolution and the End of Male Supremacy, uh, I think came out in uh, 2015 or so. Dr. Connor is a professor of anthropology and neuroscience and behavioral bi biology. As a young anthropologist, he and his wife um, uh, spent a couple of years in Africa, I believe, studying the Kung uh, society. And uh, he talks about them very fondly. He said they were the ultimate communities. <laughs> People knew each other for life, <laughs> and they talked. Um, they had nightly campfire meetings where they talked over all their experiences and worked out their differences. I think. Um, but he also talks about the separation of the public and private spheres. With increasing male coalitions and power politics, came a decline. A decline in the personal relationship. Life as a whole was no longer face to face. Private and public spheres diverged. Every male major aspect of social life, politics, economics, religion, defense, became detached from hearth and home. Women entered motherhood earlier and with shorter interbirth intervals. Their lifespans declined while men's increased. Connor says, women gave more of themselves and died younger, even as they were cut out of public life. Women continue to contribute resources, uh, obviously, <laughs> to a large extent, but now they did so on behalf of their husbands, the chiefs. Women's economic and social status became more tied to their men. The choice of a mate became less a personal decision, more a means of forging alliances and consolidating the assets between families. Connor writes, countless millions of fathers for more than two monogamous millennia disposed of their daughters on a handshake. So with that, I had to, of course, think of Jane Austen and put her lovely picture here. And I think about that idea of um, fathers <laughs> disposing of their daughters. We don't, <laughs> I think that's not happening much. Women aren't <laughs> allowing that much anymore, but we still do have that tradition of the father walking his daughter down the aisle at a, a, a wedding uh, tradition. Men and women, I'm calling this reciprocal process. Uh, it's a way of thinking about patriarchy that is a little different. I think a lot of times patriarchy is, is thought of in, as uh, male dominance. Um, but the patriarchal society and the family became the world in which both men and women adapted. The response of many women was to promote higher patriarchy. Barbara Smuts, a, a primatologist who had studied uh, baboons, wrote a very compelling paper in 1995 called The Evolutionary Origins of Patriarchy. And she proposes that humans became more patriarchal than other most other primate species. And part of, there were many reasons, there were many factors 
that led to that, but one of them was that women themselves participated in it. In pursuing their material and reproductive interests, women often engage in behaviors that promote male resource control and male control over human, over female sexuality. Women's preference for high-ranking mates and support of male ambition generally would have created a strong impetus for men to strive for high rank and its privileges. So in that way, I'm thinking that there was pressure, patriarchy puts pressure on men and pressure on women. And the significant consequences of this, I think, are that in the bigger picture, as women lost autonomy and equal status under patriarchy, the society lost the benefit of women's perspective and voice in the public sphere. We will never know what a difference her counterbalancing influence on the more aggressive male approach to governance might have had. The family is now ad adapting in a, stri a uh, stratified world. The economic security of a family was subject to the ability to compete in a complex stratified system of political and economic forces. Social class became a key determinant of one's life force. Social class and attendant attitudes and behaviors are part of what is transmitted across generations in families. Through rules of inheritance, wealth passes to future generations. The structure of the family, I believe, made it a fertile ground for forming the alliances that would work toward acquiring land, building wealth, and forming dynasties. We can think of a lot of uh, major corporations in our country that have family names on them. The family is a part of the fabric of a hierarchical society. So I was interested in the idea that the family is an economic unit. Of course, Dr. Bowen taught the family is an emotional unit. And I was thinking, what is the interface between the family as an emotional unit and an economic unit. So I put those words into the Google search and I uh, up came this uh, article by a, an economist, Friedrich Beerwald uh, from Fordham. And he wrote an article called The Family as an Economic Unit. And I thought it had some very good ideas. So I'm going to share those. He says, in the long experience of mankind, the vast majority of families were also producer units, working together on the land and in small shops to earn the family income with their own productive assets, meaning the family had more control over, over their production. Prior to the Industrial Revolution of the last 200 years, most economic units in business and farming were centered around the family. As industrialization and concentration proceed, more and more families are being cut off from ownership and direct control of productive economic units. A small number of corporations have a very large share in the total business transactions. The business of making a living is not only being transferred outside the home, but it has to be carried out in the employ of others. The home, economically speaking, is reduced to a consumer unit. This has serious consequences for the structure of the contemporary family. Economically speaking, the family is reduced to a consumer unit, the home a place for joint conception and use of material things. The family shrinks from a three generation to a two generation unit, no longer equipped to take care of elderly parents at home. As children leave home and start families of their own, parents in their middle age are reduced to living as a one-generation family. 
the decline of the family as a productive unit has substantially narrowed the framework of effective family relations. So that's all from Bayerwald, something to, I think is worth really thinking about. Now I switch to my <laughs> um, challenging subject. Um, humans become ultra-social. Um, the evolutionary origins of ultra-sociality. This is an article that I read in 2017 and I really found it very, first of all, it really strikes me as very complex systems thinking, very much as Bowen theory. And it struck me as, as having resonance, somehow having resonance with Bowen theory. So I'll just give you a few of the points that uh, Dr. Uh, Krall and Dr. Gowdy make. Um, heaven, human evolution took a decisive turn toward our sociality with the agricultural revolution. We've already talked about the ability to produce one's own food, the extensive division of labor, deeper level of interdependence, and a dynamic of expansion. Gaudi and Kral write, in only a few thousand years, humans made the transition from being just another large mammal living within the confines of local ecosystems to a species dominating the planet's biophysical systems. They argue that the driving forces in evolution, the evolution of ultra-social societies were economic, with intensified group level competition larger populations and intensive resource exploitation became competitive advantages and the social conquest of earth was underway. This is an extremely rare and extremely successful development in evolution. It is difficult to appreciate the break with the past that this represents. Ultrasociality gives species the ability to produce and expand their food supply rather than wait for nature to provide it, a new mode of production that gave them a decisive evolutionary advantage. Only a small number of species have reached the ultrasocial level of group integration. They include ants, termites, and humans. Surplus is a driving force, according to Dr. Gowdy. The drive for surplus um, production is the root of our environmental and social problems. Neither environmental destruction nor extreme inequality is due to human nature. Both are the result of production for surplus. The competitive pursuit of resources and profits seemingly intensified in the presence of abundance has occurred repeatedly through human history. This book is Resource Wars is the work of Michael Clare, a professor of peace and world security studies at Hampshire College and author of a number of books. And in Resource Wars, he gives this, I picked this book because he describes so well how, how the surplus and abundance drives behavior. He describes a pattern seen in parts of the world where rich resources are found. Discovery of gold, oil, diamonds, valuable minerals, timber, land, and even water create opportunity for massive profit. When they are found in countries that have weak, divided, or corrupt government, these countries become vulnerable to exploitation. The result has often been domestic power struggles and wars. These contests have produced an enormous toll in human life, accompanied in many cases by severe environmental damage. So this sounds like a big, a big uh, shift, but it, uh, I think it uh, is uh, uh, the next step in understanding this, um, I, I, I'm referring, to, of course, to Michael Kerr, 
Kerr's um, recent book, Bowen Theory Secrets, and in which, in which Dr. Kerr addresses this question, what is it about the appearance of abundant resources that sets off such a powerful emotional response? And he starts by uh, giving an example from another species, the ground finches of the Galapagos Islands. In a season of extraordinary rainfall, there was abundant food. The birds began a copulating frenzy, followed by a breakdown in normal mating and parenting behavior, ending up in an explosion of population. When the rain stopped, resources dropped and huge numbers of birds died. And Dr. Kerr then gives a human example that he finds, he sees an eerie similarity between the finches and human behavior in the face of abundance. And the example is the financial crisis of 2007 and 8. There was a housing bubble, subprime mortgages were given without normal credit standards. There was a high default rate, a lack of focus on the ethics of these activities and over-focus on enormous rewards. Many financial and government institutions were complicit. So the combination of abundant resources and weak constraints, I think pre presents a real challenge. Uh, humans have shown a proclivity to react with gold rush fervor in the face of abundant resources and weak constraints. Looking at both the example of the Galapagos finches and human financial crisis, Dr. Kerr writes, my conclusion is that the financial crisis reflected societal regression and that like the finches, human beings do not seem to cope well with excess. The core biology at play involves the pleasure and reward systems of the brain. Optimal stimulation of the pleasure and reward systems is an essential motivating system. However, high levels of stimulation interfere with impulse control. So in a world of surplus, I think there are, uh, we would think that would be all very positive, but I think there are ways in which it really generates anxiety. Uh, the great advantage humans gained in acquiring control over the food supply and generating a surplus seems paradoxically to have set us on a growth trajectory that is difficult, perhaps even impossible to contain. We have developed social, legal, and moral codes to regulate acquisitive instincts, but these are often overridden when opportunity for profit appears on the horizon. Far removed from our hunter-gatherer ancestors, we have created societies in which wealth and power beget more wealth and power. Chances for a secure life are largely tied to social and economic status conditions designed to stir chronic anxiety. Dr. Gowdy uh, also has points out that with this um, ultra social system, there is a decline in individual functioning. Autonomy is suppressed as the group itself becomes the economic unit. Elaborate division of labor makes the behavior of individuals simpler in ultra-social societies, even as the society grows more complex. Collective intelligence can increase while individual intelligence declines. The selective pull of the group over the individual becomes greater with increasing complexity. Again, a uh, reference to Gaudi and Kraus. Um, work on ultrasociality. I see uh, parallels between this concept of ultrasociality and Bowen's concept of the emotional system. Uh, and here 
here are a few things that I think they have in common. Um, Gaudi and Kroll thinking about the economic forces that drive the expansionist global market. Bowen's thinking on the instinctual emotional system that drives the functioning of human families and societies. In both cases, they recognize the powerful influence of larger systems in governing the behavior of individuals and subgroups. Both of them identify the loss of individuality in the face of increased group pressure as a key factor in social regression. So I just am coming to the end. <laughs> and I, it'll just be a little bit longer if you can hang in there. It's, what, where do we go from here? A few thoughts. A saving grace for humans is that we're different from ants, no matter how constrained by togetherness pressure. Humans do not lose the force for individuality, defined by Bowen as the derived to be a productive autonomous individual defined by self rather than the dictates of the group. Differentiation of self describes the variation among group members in their ability to transcend the pull of the group. And with variation, um, all people have some capacity to think independently, to be guided by principles in the face of social, economic, or political pressure to compromise principle. Bowen defined, described the differentiated family leader as one with the courage to define self who is invested in the welfare of the family as much as in self. These same qualities apply on a societal level. From this perspective, the ability of a society to discern and identify its most mature and responsible members and select them for positions of leadership is of utmost importance. <clears throat> uh, Dr. Gaudi says that it's our imperfections that may save us. We are not answer termites. Our recent ultra-social legacy is imperfect, not efficient and stable. The imperfect system creates openings for a change not presented to answer termites. How can we tap these opportunities to gain control of the human ultra-social system so that our species may once again have a sustainable and equitable way of life. <clears throat> the road not taken, and this comes uh, from Edward Wilson's book, The Social Conquest of Earth. Um, um, let's see, I, my screen is sort of covered up here. Anyway, he's talking about the, that it, at the dawn of the Neolithic era, it might have, humans might have halted population growth below the constraining minimum limit. But as a species, we did the opposite. There was no way for us to foresee the consequences of our initial success. We simply took what was given us and continue to multiply and consume in blind obedience to instincts inherited from our humbler, more brutally constrained Paleolithic ancestors. <clears throat> Unlike our ancestors, we of the 20th century have the benefit of foresight. We have knowledge of complex geophysical sy systems and the part that human activity plays in global warming and the related crises. We even have the knowledge we need to put the brakes on out of control economic growth. The realities of the 21st century call for a different kind of growth, growth in maturity, in the ability to constrain the expansionist system, the wisdom to forego energy expensive activities and personal comforts in favor of the longer term vision of a more equitable and humanistic way of life on a recovering and protected planet. In addition, it is not insignificant that a number of people feel real anguish 
about the imperiled state of the world and what the future generation will face if we do not change course. Poet Dan Hanrahan writes, quote, the problem is the longer this economy persists, the more degraded the planet becomes. That unfortunately is the design of this particular system. Its persistence is dependent upon our degrading our home and the home of all our fellow beings. This internal distance, dissonance, internal dissonance threatens to become overwhelming. And I like that very much uh, when Dan wrote that because uh, I think it captures what a lot of people and what we're hearing a great deal from younger people about the real anguish of, of knowing that that this way of life is is uh, so it costing us so greatly. John Gowdy defines three levels of governance. Um, the individual, the community, the institutions. Change must come at the individual and community levels, but most important at the institutional level. The ultra-social human economy is the uppermost limit in the governance hierarchy, and it is the most problematic. To achieve sustainability, we must design institutions to, cons to assert control over the global economy. And that is uh, comes from his chapter in a book called The State of the World. And I, of course, I have to admire um, Pope Francis. I do admire Pope Francis greatly. As a young man, he actually trained in science, I think chemistry. And in his wonderful encyclical, Laudato Se, he, uh, he describes uh, the science of climate uh, very clearly and also puts forward a moral, the moral principles that we need. Nobody is suggesting a return to the Stone Age, but we do need to slow down and look at reality in a different way to appropriate the positive and sustainable progress which has been made, but also to recover the values and the great goals swept away by our unrestrained delusions of grandeur. Our dominion over the universe should be understood more properly in the sense of responsible stewardship. And then in my, my final point, I take, I go back to Edward O. Wilson, remarks that he made in 1989 at the Georgetown University Bicentennial. Dr. Wilson said, and he was just speaking spontaneously here, the truth is we never understood the natural world. We, we never understood, well, we never, never understood it and we only think we have control. We don't even know why we respond a certain way to other organisms. We need them in diverse ways so deeply. Humanity, I would suggest, is exalted, not because we've risen so far above other living creatures, but because understanding them very well elevates our very concept of life. And so thank you, and I can uh, stop, stop sharing. Okay, there we go. I don't know, my screen is kind of blurry, but uh, thank you for, for listening. I know that was a kind of a long lecture. <laughs> So I, um, if you will raise your hand, most people will find the raise hand button under the reactions button. And I will call on people and you can ask your question to Ms. Ferreira. Okay, and um, Dr. Collier, I would like if, if John Gowdy is in the audience. I, I didn't would, see his name. I did, oh, okay, all right. And he thought he might be able to come. I was going to ask him if he wanted to make a comment. Okay, let's go go with the discussion then. Okay, if he pops in, I will let you know. I've been looking. So I'm just um, I'm just waiting. I'll let you know. 
I'm sure people will get in here. A collier, there's one person who is in his physical hands. His name is David. Okay, David. Hi. Oh. Okay, there I see you. Thank there you. Yes, I. Hand at I, the bottom. I, I, I don't have a, a hand raised button. I'm sorry. Um, that was a lovely and thought prov provoking uh, uh, lecture and by no means too long. Thank you so much. Um, I'd like to, if I may, without uh, knowing how to be quite as articulate as I wish, mention one aspect which was particularly interesting and where I went with it as you were speaking, although you also took me there very satisfyingly. I was uh, engaged by the example of the Finches uh, and their, their uh, cyc cyclical uh, procreation and mass extinction and the parallel that you, you made with it to humans. And it occurred to me that uh, the Finches uh, in Darwinian fashion, which you introduced earlier, uh, may be said thereby to have improved uh, at least their gene pool, their future society through the process. And my thought was in the economic crisis example that you, you provided, the boom and bust, uh, the challenge is for as you said, he, how humans can can do that uh, in similar situations, and uh, and of course it's family, uh, politics, and government. And in the end, I'll stop speaking to tell you where where my thoughts went, uh, where they frequently uh, go. And that is to the work of uh, John John Rawls, uh, and I forgot the name of name of his work, but some of you might be familiar with with his uh, his work of judicial philosophy. He wrote about what social compact we would choose if we did not know where in society we would we would uh, be placed. And he said, he called it the maxi men theory that we would rationally choose uh, a social compact which first allowed us, well, which guaranteed us the avoidance of the worst consequences while giving us the freedom to seek the best. And it seems to me, uh, I think you, you laid that out also, but choosing such a compact uh, would be the needed feedback system for uh, achieving many of the goals that you uh, brought brought to mind and for which I'm grateful. Thank, thank you. I, I'd love to hear your comments. David, thank you very much for bringing up John Rawls. When I was in social work school, one of uh, my classes we spent the entire quarter studying the theory of justice by John Rawls. Thank you. And I think we had a philosophy a graduate student leading the class. And uh, when I think about John Rawls, I think, well, this is, he talked about the veil of ignorance that we would not know what our position was. And it seems to me, just as you're speaking, it occurred to me how this is really part of the work of differentiation of self, is that we, we don't have a veil of ignorance. We do know what our position is in, in a society, our, both our advantages, our disadvantages. Uh, but what we can do is we can think about what would be a fair and equitable society and how we would manage our own behavior uh, to, to contribute to that kind of a family and that kind of a society. So I think, uh, I think John Rawls, uh, he's not, I think he's in the philosophical camp rather than the science camp, 
uh, but that is a very important idea that he, uh, and I, you know, I think it's part of, uh, it's an excellent, it's an excellent question that he raises, an excellent challenge that he raises. Thank you, David. Ms. Ferrer, there is um, Joel Kleber and Dan Hanrahan. Uh, yes, thanks for your presentation. Um, I was especially intrigued by your uh, comment about anxiety from plenty. And um, of course, I thought about societal regression. And I've, I've always thought of societal regression as being fueled, of course, by uh, man's relationship to nature, overpopulation, pollution, et cetera. And I'd never really thought about the anxiety that comes from plenty. And it got me thinking about uh, what is that anxiety? Uh, and what I, my first thought is it's maybe managing status, hierarchical ranking and, and how much you have or don't have. But I'm curious what your thoughts are about how you describe more of what the anxiety is in the plenty for the human. <clears throat> Well, I think anxiety is tied uh, to, uh, there's part of family functioning is the search uh, for resources. And we, you know, we need to provide for the members of the family. It's a basic function. And there's anxiety when, uh, when you're not, those resources aren't very secure. And, and I think in a lot of ways, when I heard about the, the foragers and all of that was really new to me, it seemed like their life was sustained by the communal nature of, of how they, gave, they provided resources together and, and had, they, you know, they lived in communities more. We've, I think we're, we are moving more toward a breakdown of, you know, as Bayerwald said, the, the, it's harder to sustain the three generation family. The three generation family is a very strong unit. Uh, when you, when you, you know, there's, there's more resources there. Uh, we've gotten away from it partly because, um, because it, it also is a challenging thing to do to live in a three generation family. But I think we've moved toward less community, more isolation, more going out, out of the home to work and dealing with the competitive economic system. You know, certainly now we're seeing, you know, uh, Gaudi writes that, you know, the individual is reduced uh, and almost becomes expendable uh, when the uh, larger economic system is is um, you know exerting such power. Um, I, any what are, it, it, does that does that fit at all with what you're thinking, Phil? Or yeah, I I well, I, I you stimulated my thoughts, so it, it's good to hear what you're saying. I don't know if I have much more to say, but um, it, it it does seem counterintuitive. You'd think with plenty you would have less anxiety, but of course. I can think of examples in families where it contributes to exactly the opposite. And you're describing uh, more uh, disconnection from the community as well as a competition for resources that would increase with the plenty. And those two things make sense to me. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. There's Dan Hanrahan, Regina Ferreira, and Catherine Baker. So you've got three more. You have to unmute yourself. Thank you for the really edifying lecture, Stephanie, and bringing together all those vast eras and some of their distinctions. Um, relevant to your talk, I've been reading recently a, a new book by an Aboriginal philosopher named Tyson Yunkaporta. And it resonates with other books I've written, I've read by 
philosophers representing something different than Western philosophy, who are coming from traditions, social traditions not defined by such rigid hierarchy. In fact, by traditions defined more by some of the hunter-gatherer life ways that you were describing. And something uh, Jack D. Forbes, for example, from the United States, Peter Gray on Psychology Today has been writing a long series of essays about hunter-gatherer socialization of children. And something I've noticed with uh, Tyson Young Caporta and those other writers is that they identify within the human a tendency to become very narcissistic, overly competitive. And the way Tyson Young Caporta describes it, he says that Aboriginal society and thinking is structured in such a way to have people work against the tendency to think I'm greater than. And in fact, in his book, he has art that he's done. And one of the central pieces in the book uses the greater than symbol. And what he proposes is that when I am greater than you takes over as a societal ethos, the society is probably doomed and their relationship to the planet uh, probably along with it. And what happens ecologically is that people start to view the planet as objects to be exploited rather than subjects to be listened to. And what's, the last thing I would say is what struck me as he's saying this is the central point upon which all of their culture is designed, which is to not let the narcissist greater than take over and destroy their society. Whereas in the United States, that's actually the founding directive of the society, which is that you should project yourself above other people. And it's called the American dream, but it, it has a nightmare quality to the other side as we're seeing. Do you think there's any way we can get back to some sort of harmony and sustainability without a radical, a radical destruction of the current Way of um, way of thinking about life, and an adaptation of something more along the lines of what I described uh, from Tyson Young Caporta. Oh wow! Well, that's a big question, Dan. I I I'm not in a position to make. I don't know of anybody that's really uh, trying to make any predictions about about where uh, where we're headed in the longer term except that we are headed into danger if we do not deal with with the climate and and i think i take i take a lot of uh, encouragement from the amount of of organizing that's going on a lot of uh, organizations dealing with all different special aspects of the problem uh, and um the, you know, but, you know, we're up against, I think, in a, an American culture that puts a very high virtue on economic growth and the economic growth we measure in GDP, which is not a, a measure of the quality of life. Uh, and, and so that I think that way of thinking, I think, really has to change. Um, you know, I, I, I know uh, it's the individual level, the community level, but according to Gaudi, it's also the institutional level uh, that it has to happen, you know, in, in at that larger level where so many of the decisions are made that, that control life. Well, and the last thing I would just say as a follow-up is it is my belief that change on an institutional level by definition can't cannot occur unless we radically change the foundational values of the society. Okay. Because it, the, 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 in our nation, for example, was founded on the idea of individual accumulation as the prime objective. Yeah. That, that's in direct contrast 
to any notion of sustainability. So I'm, I'm, I guess what I'm advocating is a complete abandonment of most of the founding values of this society. Well, that's okay. <laughs> okay, well, you are um, always a challenge for me to, <laughs> it's always a challenge for me to keep up with you, Dan. Thank you. <laughs> Ms. Ferrer, you have three um, waiting. It's going to be Regina Ferreira, Catherine Baker, and okay. now Victoria Harris. Okay. So I guess I'm next, Regina. Um, it was great to hear uh, hear you go through all these ideas from these wonder these great thinkers, and especially since you and I have been talking about these ideas for so long, and you've been presenting about them and writing about them for years. And that was great to hear. I, you, um, I really liked how you pulled together all these different ideas in a way that made sense. And I, you know, it's really interesting to think about the, um, the economic function of families and how that has affected the emotional function. Um, I think that's, uh, the fertile ground for, for probably a lot more research. Um, you know, the idea that the economic functioning of, of humans in these three different times has, you know, has affected values um, and, the, and the structure of not only society, but of course the family was part of this. So um, Anyway, that was all really interesting. I think this idea of plenty and abundance or overabundance um, relating to anxiety, the th I don't think it's the plenty part that gets people anxious. I think what happens is you talked about how when there's, when there's great excess, um, there's also great um, stratification because the, dis the, re the excess is not ever distributed equally. I don't think there's any example in human history where excess has been distributed equally that I can think of. And it's usually quite unequal. Mm -hmm. So I think it's the, it's the unequal distribution of wealth that leads to anxiety. And mm -hmm. even for the people at the top, I mean, I, I've been comfortable economically in my life, but I'm very anxious about uh, poor people and homeless people and um, people who don't have enough to eat. Um, yeah evokes a whole lot of anxiety in me. And one, one last, th or a couple last thoughts. The, I think the development of money and monetization of nature and human labor has created a false valuation of both human labor and nature. It's, it's an arbitrary valuation that has nothing to do with real value. And I think that has taken us into a realm of emotionality and really far from objectivity. Yeah. And the other thing is just the pace of change. Each of those three phases got way shorter. Yeah. And we've only been in fossil fuels for 250 years and we've already managed to turn it into a disaster scenario. Well, that has, you know, that has been very powerful, obviously, but both uh, Ian Morris and uh, Melvin Connor and John Gowdy have appointed to the very long period of human life on earth with the, the hunter-gatherer societies are considered by those who study them to have been quite egalitarian. And so it's, I think it's definitely possible for people to do it. I, I don't think human nature is in, and in, in so innately uh, entrenched in uh, competition and uh, hierarchy that we can't develop a more, a much more egalitarian society. So should we move to? Yes, it's gonna be Catherine Baker, Victoria Harrison, and then Anne McKnight. <laughs> We've got three now. <laughs> yeah, hi, Stephanie. Thank you so much for doing that. Um, am I unmuted? I hope. Am I unmuted? Yeah. Yes, we can hear you. Oh, good. I just want to thank you so much, Stephanie, for that wonderful overview of our species and, uh, and the planet that we inhabit. 
It was just inspiring and, and impressive that you pulled it all together in just an hour. It was incredible. Um, I was delighted that you mentioned our friend and colleague, uh, Michael Clare, who uh, was here in Western Massachusetts. And I've um, been working with him on a, on a special group that is um, um, focused on the, the elimination of nuclear weapons which is kind of pro provides the ultimate existential crisis for our speech species and for the planet. Right. It's with the, the, the uh, ultimate anxiety in a world of surplus being the this existential anxiety and uh, generated by our surplus capability for destruction. Yeah. If you call that the being pinned down in a been down in a one-up position, uh, those who were able to do that. But the, yeah. the, um, Michael Clare is a very, very clear uh, but disturbing thinker as he's addressing that. So it was yeah. good to have him included. Thanks. Thank you so yeah. much. OK, thank you for the comment. I want to go further in studying Michael Clare. He is, I know he has more recent books too. Thank you. Toria Harrison. Stephanie, I can't get any light on my face. So I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna speak from the dark here in, in Houston, Texas. Um, so you know that I've been trying to think about how the reactiveness to threat stirs adaptation in evolution. Yeah. And here's where your presentation has helped me put some words around this. That reactiveness to threat for the human is stirred, that, that conditions in the natural environment, climate and its impact, and population stir reactiveness to threat before we're aware of the reactions or the conditions stirring them. And those are at play and underway, minute to minute, day to day. And you just described, I think, the best history of when, where, and how that is set in motion that operates in our form of life. I don't think we know where it will go, where human adaptation can yeah. go. Um, I think you described so well how uh, the difference that our ability to be aware and then use that awareness makes possible adaptation that might not be possible otherwise. Mm -hmm. I got a question and there may not be time for this, but the question is, what is the evidence? What do you see as the evidence that we are not capable of overriding the natural constraints and the reactiveness that is already producing adaptation. What's the evidence that we can't override that? Well, the evidence is that we have overridden a lot of the constraints. I mean, you know, you you uh, you know, the population by itself is is you know beyond any other large mammal species. So we have. You know, human knowledge, human culture, um, you know, what we have done and, you know, you have cities with 25 million people living in them. I mean, so that's overridden. We've overridden the natural world in that way. Uh, I, I, well, this will be fun to continue. I don't think so. I think that that puts us up against the constraints that are evident in, in the impact of, uh, of environment on reproduction. For example, reproduction, we can't override the impact of these factors on reproduction or on, um, on, on, on symptoms of chronic illness that are present. 
yeah. in this population under these circumstances. Yeah. Anyway, that would be fun okay. to talk about another time. Okay, well, we're going to have to Thank continue you. our dialogue, Victoria, and keep, just keep it going because there's, uh, you know, I do remember Dr. Bowen's words were uh, that, that humans knew more by their instinctive radar than by their logical thinking that we were running out of new frontiers to explore. Uh, that, that the awareness of, of the imbalance that we, were, that we now have with the earth was dawning on us a long time ago. Um, you know, I think there's a great emphasis on keeping new, inventing new kinds of energy so we can keep consuming energy at, at the same level and uh, you know, it's that's a big question. I think as to whether whether we can do that. Um, you know, I don't know. I the complexities of it get to be, you know, <laughs> mind-boggling. <laughs> Thank you. You have Ann McKnight and Randy Fra Frost got his hand in there at the last minute, so. <laughs> Fascinating lecture. I mean, I you covered so many areas, um, Stephanie. But there were, you know, the one thought I had about the, the hunter gatherers is there is evidence that the hunter that the human overrode nature way back with the hunter gatherers. I mean, what happened to the boy mammoth? You know, they were hunted to extinction, or the large deer in Europe. Um, so that I think there is an instinctual part of the human, whatever way they're organized, to to survive, you know, at an instinctual level in whatever way they can, even though it, it <clears throat> exhausts the resources. But anyway, that's I mean, sometimes I think the hunter gatherers are like the original, you know, <laughs> great person. And, uh, but anyway, what I really wanted to talk about was the, um, the impact of abundance. Mm -hmm. and, you know, in my senior years, I can't, although I've talked about this guy, there is this man in who, um, who did research in Sweden about the periods of, of uh, excess and starvation. Maybe you you can remember his name or oh, somebody like that. And, and he studied the epigenetic, um, you know, implications yeah. of what happened in this, the, the um, area with abundance and, um, and <clears throat> what he discovered was that when children were born in abundance, that their children had a lot more, lived less, less um, long and had more diabetes and health aspects, uh, dilemmas than the, the children who were born with, um, in the periods of starvation. Mm -hmm. And I think that I mean, it's an interesting aspect. Yeah. And, you know, we in the United States live with abundance, even though there's a disparity of levels of uh, yeah. resources. But we're, you know, we have a horrible health history. Yeah. And yeah. Disease and, you know, and, yeah. uh, weight. And I, I don't know if, if it's just anxiety or if the human needs to be able to bump up against its. Uh, challenges in order to maintain an equilibrium. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know, but yeah. I, I think that um, it was Berenson, but anyway, I think that study yeah. is absolutely fascinating about going down. Well, okay, and uh, share the uh, reference that you share the reference to that uh, work that you're talking about. I'd like to know more about that. I do think abundance, people who live in great 
wealth, I I think of that as a, its own kind of trap. <laughs> Uh, that that you can be entrapped in abundance, uh, or you know, I, 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 in a different way, but uh, entrapped as much as people are entrapped in poverty. You know, um, it's a different. There's a set of a different set of pressures. Uh, I I think there's a, the the new psychology today has um, a title uh, article called the good enough life, the good enough life. <laughs> I think if we could figure out what that is, uh, we would um, we would relieve a lot of our anxiety. <laughs> what is good enough? How do you define that? Thank you. Thank you. Randy Frost, and there's two minutes. Or actually, one minute now. One minute. Oh, well. Um, I was just thinking about you know, all these challenges that you've put forward, um, and then I was also remembering uh, Dr. Bowen's comment at the end of one of the two chapters he wrote on societal emotional process, in which he said, in order to actually deal adequately with challenge of the human living increasingly out of harmony with the natural world will require a change, an order of change in the human that we're not yet able to contemplate. I'm just wondering, how would you uh, find that change that we're not yet able to contemplate? <laughs> Well, I do, uh, I do think there are a number of good writers putting out programs for how we can change. Uh, that, that is another aspect of John Gowdy's work. And I, I should mention he, has, um, he was a presenter at the spring conference on creating a climate for change. And he has a book coming out, uh, Ultra Social, The Evolution of human nature and the quest for a sustainable future. And in that book, uh, I had a chance to preview some of it. In that book, he does map out a program for change that's quite encompassing. And 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 it's, it's, it's the elements of it are out there. We are beginning to see, you know, some movement, what we call progressive change, um, moving us more toward regulating the excesses and you know getting getting back into more of a balance you know getting out i think our our society has hit a point of really extremes you know the more the polarization the extremes have been you know kind of troubling us uh, a lot recently and uh but it, it, but people are thinking and writing and you know it's a matter of how how do you bring societies along uh to share some of the more enlightened thinking and um and 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 get away from you know that um some of that, you know, the American dream that Dan was talking about, some of that, you know, wanting, you know, having, uh, you know, such a high expectation for, a, 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 you know, um, an affluent life, even beyond anything that, that we need, you know. <laughs> um, you know, but it, once you have what you need, why, why is there any point in, accumulating more you know? maybe maybe that is what the hunter gatherers were able to to figure out thank you miss ferreira again Curran would like to comment now thank you so much uh miss ferreira for a wonderful presentation that i'm sure will am i unmuted you are, yes. Okay. 
um, for a wonderful presentation that generates more questions than we have time to address. So hopefully people will be in touch with her if, need, if you wish and get some of those questions answered. Um, next month is the, uh, the Thursday professional lecture series will be on a Monday night on April the 5th to accommodate a, an adjusted schedule around the spring conference. The uh, presenter will be uh, Libby Copeland who wrote The Lost Family, How DNA Testing is Upending Who We Are. Here is the book. I do recommend getting it. It is very readable and I think you'll find it fascinating as you will find her. Um, we also have a clinical, con I mean, uh, an ethics meeting tomorrow for those who need CEUs for ethics. So you can sign up for that tonight. There is a fee for that. It's from 9.45 to 9.30 to 2.45. So those who need uh, CEUs, please go ahead and sign up. You can be included in that meeting. Um, thank you everyone for all of your participation. It's been a, a most interesting evening and um, we'll see you later.